Uh, Professor uh, John Ellis, who, uh, as I understood, is uh, in a bimodal distribution between King's College London and uh, CERN in Geneva. Uh, so I could uh, go over the, the various details uh, given about uh, John's uh, biography that you can basically look up for yourself, a long history of involvement in uh, high energy physics. And primarily the thing that I find most interesting is his knack for translating theoretical prediction into experiments that actually can lead to some meaningful uh, measurements. And in that capacity, he's led and uh, drove the vision of many uh, projects, the LHC being uh, uh, one of them. And he will be telling us uh, more about that. But in thinking about the introduction, I was thinking about uh, humanity's concern, actually with the infinite, infinitesimally small and the infinitely large, something that goes back way back in the history of recorded thought, whether in myth or in poetry or in literature. And I'm very happy to see him introducing the aesthetic uh, dimension. And uh, this is certainly uh, the subject that concerns us today, well, how the infinitesimally small actually holds secrets to the largest structure uh, the universe itself in particular. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us, uh, John, talking about this uh, beautiful subject from your uh, long-standing perspective. I'm very happy to see students from the Lebanese University. I'm very happy to see high school students, our physics students, and faculty. It's a rather dry time of the year in terms of end of semester, but it's great to see this audience. And uh, we're very happy for you to be taking us on this journey. Thank you very much, John. Okay, well, thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation to give a talk here. Um, this is my uh, first visit to Lebanon. I hope it's not going to be the last. And uh, as you say, my topic for today, I think, is a sort of a universal subject, uh, namely the connection between uh, the, the very small and, and the very large. And uh, I like to sort of take as my sort of artistic uh, framework for this, this uh, rather famous painting by uh, Paul Gauguin, which you're probably familiar with. So uh, here they are on a South Sea Island somewhere, asking themselves in French, uh, some very basic questions. Uh, what are we? Where do we come from? And uh, where are we going? And uh, I would argue that those are indeed universal questions, timeless questions, and uh, those are precisely the questions that we uh, address with our experiments in uh, particle physics, uh, in particular at CERN, as I'm going to describe. So uh, the questions were originally posed uh, in French. And uh, then they were translated in English. And uh, now I'm going to try to translate them into uh, the language of physics. So uh, what are we? So uh, the way that as a physicist, I look at that question is, what is matter made of? Uh, as I'm going to discuss in, in a moment, of course, we know we're made of atoms, but what are the atoms made of and so on? And uh, one of the corollary questions for that is uh, why do things weigh? Uh, atoms in particular, they have mass. Uh, electrons have mass. If they didn't have mass, then there wouldn't be any atoms to make us up. So a key question, a key aspect of this question, what are we, is uh, what makes things have mass? Uh, where do we come from? So uh, where, what was the origin of the matter in the universe? Um, you think about it a bit, it's a bit surprising that having found that there is antimatter as well as antimatter, that, you know, why is it that matter dominates over antimatter in the universe today? Or, or why is there not just simply radiation? So particle physics could help provide an answer to that question. Uh, what is the dark matter that fills the universe? So uh, you've probably heard, and I'm going to discuss in more detail later on, uh, astronomers tell us that actually most of the matter in the universe is some sort of invisible, weakly interacting dark stuff. Uh, what is that? Is it made of particles? Maybe. Uh, how does the universe evolve? 
how do we get from the beginning of the universe to where we are now, and for that matter, what's going to happen in the future? Another one of uh, Gilgamesh's uh, questions. Uh, the universe is actually quite old. Uh, it's almost 14 billion years old. And uh, as a physicist, this is a little bit surprising because the only scales that we have in physics are you know, very, very small time scales or very, very small length scales. So we obviously live in a, in a rather special solution of the fundamental equations of physics. And uh, the third Gilgang question, uh, where are we going? What is the future of the universe? So uh, I would argue that uh, the job of us scientists in general, but particularly physicists, particularly particle physicists, is to uh, ask these questions and hopefully provide some answers. Now, the uh, challenging thing for physicists is that the answers to most of these questions are going to require physics beyond what we know, beyond what we call the standard model of physics. And uh, that's where the LHC may come in. That is the biggest tool, that's the most powerful tool that we have for looking for physics uh, beyond what we already know. And I'll return to that in a moment. Okay, so uh, here is a, a one slide summary of the history of the universe. So the uh, universe is about 13.7, 13.8 billion years old. Uh, the visible universe uh, extends about 10 to 28 centimeters in uh, all directions. It contains stars, which are inside galaxies. It also contains radiation. So there's this uh, sort of patch over on the left-hand side called cosmic microwave background radiation, which uh, was emitted from when the universe was about 300,000 years old. Okay, so uh, this sets the scene for asking our questions. What are we? What are all these things in the universe made of? What's the origin of matter? What happened? At the beginning of the Big Bang, back before even the cosmic microwave background radiation was released into the universe. And what's going to happen in the future? So if you look, it's been expanding for almost 14 billion years, and the expansion was gradually slowing down, but now it seems to be increasing again. And uh, maybe I'll have something to say about that towards the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, as I already mentioned, we all know that uh, the visible matter in the universe is made up out of atoms. And uh, in the first half of the last century, uh, Rutherford established that those atoms contained clouds of electrons uh, in orbit around relatively small nuclei. Uh, later on in the uh, last century, it was established that those uh, nuclei are made up out of smaller particles called protons and neutrons. And uh, if I had been giving this uh, talk, say, 80 or 90 years ago, uh, then I might have implied, suggested, that protons and neutrons were fundamental constituents of matter. In fact, now we know different. In the second half of the last century, it was established that actually Protons and neutrons are made up out of smaller things that are called quarks, which, as far as we know, could be the most fundamental constituents of that. Now, uh, I've situated uh, atoms, nuclei, and quarks in relation to Albert Einstein and his kid sister, who are in the middle of this picture because they're roughly speaking halfway between. The largest scale that we know about, the size of the visible universe today, about 10 to the plus 28 centimeters. And the smallest scale that we uh, care to speculate about, uh, speaking 10 to the minus 32 centimeters scale where gravity becomes very strong. So uh, how might these two ends of the, uh, of the ruler get connected? 
Well, over on the right hand side, I've got a typical picture of a, a field of galaxies. As I already mentioned, those galaxies contain not just visible matter in stars and gas, but also invisible matter, dark matter. Where did that dark matter come from? Well, probably from processes that occurred very early in the history of the universe. What we do with a Large Hadron Collider and uh, similar experiments is that we make small bangs which recreate the conditions that applied in the very early history of the Big Bang. And by studying those little bangs in detail, we hope to understand the secrets of the Big Bang, uh, such as where the matter came from, uh, what gives it a mass, what's the dark matter, and so on. So it, it, it's worth remembering that uh, initially, much of our knowledge about the fundamental constituents of matter actually came from astrophysical experiments, not from laboratory experiments. Uh, so it was just over a century ago that uh, Victor Hess, that you see there, uh, went up under a balloon and uh, he discovered that the Earth was being bombarded by cosmic rays, so energetic particles coming from cosmic accelerators. And when those cosmic rays hit the upper atmosphere, their energy is converted into all sorts of other particles. And uh, in particular, uh, many species of particles were discovered in those cosmic rays, like uh, the muon, like antiparticles, like ion, many other particles. But around the middle of the last century, it was realized that if one wanted to study those particles uh, in detail, you needed to produce them in controlled conditions in the laboratory. And uh, so that gave rise to the construction of uh, accelerators, and in particular, particle colliders, if you like, reproduce the collisions of cosmic rays, but in a place where you can see them, as opposed to up there in the atmosphere. Okay, so here's a, a picture of a typical uh, detector around the collision point where we make these little bangs. So I, I like to compare it to a sort of cylindrical onion. And uh, each of those cylindrical layers has the job of uh, recognizing some particular type of particle might be produced. Photon, for example, or an electron or, or a muon. Now, the sorts of collisions which are made, for example, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN uh, involve energies which are comparable to the energies of the constituents of the universe when it was about a uh, peak of a second old, a millionth of a millionth of a second old. And uh, that's why we think that we may be able to study the secrets of the Big Bang using these small bangs. So I'm going to go quite quickly through the second half of the last century. Uh, those who saw the uh, discovery of what we call the standard model of particle physics. So this was proposed in the uh, late 1960s by uh, Abdul Salam from Pakistan, whom you see there, and two American theorists, Dasham and Weinberg. And uh, they made essential use of the ideas of a guy called Peter Higgs that I'll come back to later on because it plays quite a big role in this story. So they proposed their theory in 1967. People didn't pay very much attention. Uh, but then in the early 1970s, experiments at CERN and elsewhere started finding new types of phenomena that were predicted by the standard model. And uh, later on, in particular in the 1990s at CERN, uh, very detailed measurements uh, verified uh, the predictions of the standard model with quite high precision. So, for example, here you see a tiny red dot that represents the experimental measurement, and the green line is the standard model prediction. Actually, that picture is a cheat because the red dot has been expanded by a factor of 10 so that you can see it. 
that tells you how precise the agreement is. So, so what does this standard model contain? Well, uh, it contains obviously electromagnetism. And uh, since I'm now affiliated with King's College London, I have to uh, advertise James Clark Maxwell, who uh, wrote down his equations when he was professor at uh, King's just over 150 years ago. And uh, he, of course, predicted electromagnetic waves. Uh, he identified light as being due to these waves. He actually calculated the velocity of light. And uh, Albert Einstein was a big fan. Uh, several quotations, one scientific epoch and another, one scientific epoch ended and another began with James Clark Maxwell. So that's electromagnetism. Uh, but then we have the strong nuclear force, which uh, binds parks together inside protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons together inside uh, nuclei. And uh, there's a theory for that, which is uh, basically modeled after Maxwell's theory. But it's more complicated, but I won't go into the details. And uh, that postulates particles like the photons, the particle of light, which are called gluons because they stick things together. And uh, together with Mary Goyar and Graham Ross, we suggested an experiment to discover the gluon, which was carried out a few years uh, later, uh, here's a picture of an event where uh, electron and positron collided, and they out came quark, an antiquark, and a gluon. Don't ask me which is a gluon, we don't know, but one of them must be the gluon. And then we have the weak interactions uh, responsible for uh, radioactive decays. So uh, Yukawa made the suggestion that uh, those weak interactions might do, be due to the exchange, not of a massless particle like the photon and gluon, but a massive particle. So initially there's quite a lot of confusion about uh, how heavy that particle might be. In the standard model, it was predicted to be about 80 times the mass of the proton. To produce that particle, uh, CERN engineers built an energetic collider and an experimental team led by Carlo Rubia here uh, discovered uh, this massive W particle, which decayed into this white line here, which is a very energetic electron. Now that, of course, raises a problem. Proton has no mass, the gluon has no mass, but this W particle weighs as much as a medium-sized nucleus. So where did that mass come from? So, so if I summarize the standard model, uh, in the top half of the slide, I've got the fundamental constituents of matter. So on the left, we've got quarks. On the right, we've got the electron and a couple of uh, heavier, uh, similar particles, the muon, the tau, and we've got three different types of neutrino. And in the bottom half of the slide, we have the fundamental interactions. So gravity, uh, electromagnetism, James Clark Maxwell, just saying, uh, the W responsible for the weak nuclear force, and uh, the gluons responsible for strong nuclear force. Now, I've circled in red one thing which is missing on this slide, which is an explanation for the origin of particle masses. If the electron didn't have a mass, it would always travel at the speed of light and it would run away from nuclei at the speed of light. You'd never see an atom. If the W particle didn't have a mass, then radioactivity would be a much stronger effect than it is, and life would be impossible. So where do these particle masses come from? And this is where 
Peter Higgs comes in. So you might think, well, you know, what's the puzzle? I mean, we know about mass. We know from Newton, the weight is proportional to mass. W is equal to mg. Well, yes, but g is gravity. Well, what is m? Newton didn't explain. Einstein, of course, said that energy is related to mass, E equals mc squared. But he didn't explain where the m came from either. That's where Peter Higgs comes in, and uh, that's his uh, theory on the blackboard behind him. And uh, I'll resist mentioning that uh, Peter Higgs is actually both an undergraduate student and a uh, graduate student at King's College London, although he had the poor taste to go to uh, Edinburgh to write down his theory. Now, just in case you're going to forget what a theory looks like, I'm going to have a t shirt. So, this just serves as all of an aid memoir for the rest of the talk. Now, a, a key aspect of his theory is that uh, there should be another particle, not on the previous slide, uh, which is called the Higgs boson after Peter Higgs. And uh, after he wrote down his theory in 1964, that somehow became the holy grail of particle, particle physicists to see whether his prediction was right or not. So, so, so don't worry, I'm not going to go any further. I'm just going to get rid of this. So, According to Higgs's theory, uh, there is some universal field, a little bit like the electromagnetic field or the gravitational field in principle, but key difference, this field is universal, homogeneous, and isotropic. It's not like uh, gravity, which has a source like the sun, or electromagnetism, which has a source like an electron charge. So, so this field is a universal medium, and I like to compare it to uh, Siberia in the middle of winter. So you have this field of snow extending in all directions, and uh, particles have to travel through the Higgs field in the same way that you know, Russians have to travel through this snow field. So if you're lucky, you might have skis. In that case, you go very fast, you skew across the top of the uh, Higgs snowfield, and that's like a particle with no mass that doesn't interact with the snow. Field. Or you might be, uh, you might uh, not have skis, you might just have snowshoes. In that case, you sink into the snow, that's like a particle that interacts with the Higgs field. You travel slower than the skier. And that's like a particle with mass that always travels less than the speed of light. Or you might have no snow equipment at all, in which case you are going to sink deeper into the snow, you're going to go much slower. That's part like a particle with a heavy mass. So uh, particles have mass to the extent that they interact with this universal Higgs snow field. Then, the question is, what is that snow field made out of? Well, snow field is made out of flakes, like snowflakes. And so, corresponding, there's a quantum of the Higgs field, which is the boson, the Higgs boson, that he predicted. So, uh, you would be forgiven for thinking this is a somewhat uh, flaky theory, but it works. So uh, here's actually a, a picture of uh, Peter Higgs in uh, 1965, working out uh, some of the uh, details of his theory. And uh, his boson plays a key role in uh, our understanding of physics today and uh, highlighting how we might hope to go beyond it and uh, answer go against questions. So I first got interested in the Higgs boson uh, in 1975, 
together with Mary Gaga and Dimitri Nanopoulos, we are uh, into the phenomenological profile of the Higgs boson where we discussed how it might be produced and how it might decay. Well, back then, these ideas were regarded as being very speculative. I think the numbers of papers on how to look for the Higgs boson could be uh, counted on the fingers of one, possibly two hats. And uh, the distinguished gray-haired professors in the front row looking at you, Ali, uh, were very skeptical. So that's one of the reasons why, at the end of our paper, we said, well, we don't want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson, but we do think that experiments that might have it produced should know what it looks like. Well, fortunately, uh, experimental physicists didn't take our bad advice. Uh, they built the NHC and its experiments, uh, with one of the primary motivations being to look for the Higgs boson. So uh, the white line here shows you the outline of where the LHC is located. It's actually located in a tunnel on average 100 meters underground. And uh, in case you're wondering, uh, my office is around there. My, my son office, that is. So if you go down in the tunnel, then you see this uh, string of magnets, 27 kilometers in length. So they curve away into the distance. And uh, when the thing is operating, you have thousands of billions of protons circulating in opposite directions. And uh, they make their little collisions at four places around the ring. And every time they do that, then the energy of two flies is released. So that energy is enough to make heavy particles like, for example, the Higgs boson. Uh, maybe it can also tell us the origin of the dark matter. Maybe we'll produce dark matter particles in the LHC. Uh, it certainly tells us about the primordial plasma that filled the universe when it was a fraction of a second old. And it can also give us insights into the difference between matter and antimatter that I'll come back to later on. So as I mentioned, uh, around the ring, you have uh, four collision points. So each one of them is surrounded by one of those uh, cylindrical onions that I mentioned previously. So uh, top left, we have Alice, which is looking at the plasma that fills the early universe. Top right and bottom left, we have Atlas and CMS, uh, the big detectors that discovered the Higgs boson and are now looking the dark matter. And bottom right, we have LHCB, which is trying to understand the difference between matter and antimatter. And uh, I'm very glad that uh, Lebanon is uh, now getting involved in the CMS experiment. So uh, let me now discuss what happened in uh, 2012 when the Higgs boson was discovered. And there uh, were so particle physicists who were very excited. Uh, I call that mass hysteria. So, uh, what happened? So, uh, the Atlas and CMS experiments started seeing events that could be due to the production and subsequent decay of the Higgs boson. Higgs boson is about 10 to, the 20, 10 to the minus 20 seconds, glacial lifetime. So here's a, actually a computer simulation of uh, a Higgs production event. So two protons collided diagonally like that. We produced a bunch of charged particles that show up as these uh, curved tracks colored in yellow. A bunch of neutral particles don't need tracks, they just need blobs of energy. And you can see in this particular event, there are two charged tracks which are almost straight, two very energetic particles. And another two over there, and uh, in this simulation, they were produced by the decay of a Higgs boson. So in 2012, Atlas and CMS started seeing events like that. We also started seeing events like this here. This is a real event, not a simulation. But again, you see these 
curved yellow tracks, charged particles. You see uh, blobs corresponding to uh, energetic neutral particles. And you see two very big blobs, bottom right and top left, which are thought to be due to energetic photons, which could have come from the decay of a Higgs boson. That was one of the things that we had calculated back in 1975. And it's uh, one of the cleanest signals for the production and decay of the Higgs. So uh, mass hysteria hit not only the uh, particle physics community, but uh, many newspapers around the world. So a new particle was discovered. And uh, Peter Higgs came to CERN for the announcement. Here we are on the right hand side, uh, talking perhaps for the first time with a guy in the middle, Francois Anclair, who was one of the other proponents of this sort of snowfield mechanism, although we didn't predict the existence of the Higgs boson. That's why we call it a Higgs boson. We don't attach anybody else's name to it. And uh, then I've uh, circled here in red, uh, Fabio de Gianotti, who was the head of the Atlas collaboration at the time. And she announced her collaboration's results. And uh, she then went on to become director general of CERN, uh, proving that there's no glass ceiling at CERN. So what happened on July the 4th, 2012, was the discovery of a new particle was, was announced. But one could not be sure that it was an exposal. And it looked like an exposal. But did it actually you know, fill the missing space in the particle jigsaw puzzle? Does it have all the right properties? Uh, is it the right shape? Does it have the right size? Is it really the Higgs boson? And uh, for a while, the uh, LHC experiments chased uh, the production and decay of this particle to see that it was consistent with being the Higgs boson of the standard model or not. And one of the key predictions is that since particles get their masses from the Higgs boson, Couplings of those particles to the Higgs boson should be proportional to their masses. And that's what this plot is testing. Horizontal axis, particle mass. Vertical axis, coupling of the Higgs boson to those particles. The prediction is that the coupling should be linear in the mass. And that's consistent with the data. And it's worth saying that this extends over the many orders of magnitude. So uh, this new particle walks and quacks like a Higgs boson, as uh, we wrote in a paper that I uh, did with uh, my then PhD student. Now, perhaps just one little comment. So although this discovery was made at CERN, it was not made by CERN. It was made by teams of literally thousands of physicists from around the world. And, uh, this map here shows you uh, the countries of origin of uh, physicists working at CERN. So the, the dark blue ones are the member states of CERN. Uh, the green ones are non-European countries that we have uh, agreements with, big agreements. Uh, Pale blue are associate members of CERN. Other countries with an agreement with CERN are marked in red, uh, including Lebanon. And uh, at the time when these data were uh, put on the slide, there were 23 uh, scientists and engineers from Lebanon who were participating in CERN experiments. And I, I hope that number is going to increase. But then I have another comment. So this is a picture taken in the 1990s during the construction of the CMS experiment. And uh, those things there 
uh, cartridges from Russian naval shells, which were melted down in Belarus uh, using uh, money provided by the United States and converted into parts of the CMS detector. And I show that just to emphasize that uh, this tremendous discoveries in particle physics are made possible by international collaboration. And uh, it's very sad to see aspects of that collaboration uh, disappearing. Okay, so in uh, 2013, the Nobel Prize Committee gave the Nobel Prize to uh, Peter Higgs and to uh, Francois Angelaire. And uh, they had a quotation in the citation. Today, we believe that beyond any reasonable doubt, it is a Higgs boson. And uh, my students and I were very happy with that because that quotation was taken from our paper. Okay, so the Higgs discovery was certainly a big deal. As I already mentioned a couple of times, without it, there would be no atoms. Massless electrons would escape nuclei at the speed of light. We know heavy nuclei, weak interactions would be weak, life would be impossible, and everything would be radioactive. It's got to be a Higgs boson, big deal. So at this point, you know, if you were a funding agency, you might say, well, look, uh, congratulations, you've completed the standard model, that's it. You can go home. Uh, but I would respond with this quotation from uh, T.S. Eliot in a poem he wrote, to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. So the way I interpret that is that by completing the standard model, we provide ourselves with a uh, firm basis for thinking about what other physics is out there, physics that could explain uh, the dark matter, that could explain the origin of matter, that could explain the size of the universe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is when the fun starts. So uh, just to uh, convince you of this, I have this list of uh, seven fundamental problems beyond the standard model. Seven because of James Bond. And I have uh, paraphrased the title of one of his movies. And I have also paraphrased James Bond and Bagger Giannotti. So, uh, what are these open issues? So, in the standard model, we do the calculations, it seems that empty space is unstable. So this provides a rather unpleasant answer to the question, what is, where are we going? The answer is in a collapse, uh, but maybe not. Uh, what is the dark matter? What is the origin of matter? Why do particles have the masses that they do? What about neutrinos that I've hardly said anything about? Inflation is the theory for how the universe got to be so big and old. Quantum gravity, uh, that's the most fundamental problem in theoretical physics. So don't worry, no danger of unemployment in theoretical physics or experimental physics. So, so let me just focus down a little bit on the Higgs boson. So, so the Higgs boson is a different type of particle from everything else. It's not particle of matter like an electron or a quark. It's not a force particle like a photon or the gluon. Its couplings with other particles are not subject to the same sorts of theoretical constraints. For example, there's nothing that tells you how it couples to the different particles of matter, where the hierarchy of different masses of particles, which range over five orders of magnitude, uh, where they come from. The magnitude of the Higgs mass, mu, is itself a puzzle, a 
And why is that scale so much smaller than the scale of gravity? Vortic coupling lambda. If you look at what happens at high scales, small value of lambda tells you that it's going to become negative at high energies. That's what gives you this instability of the electroweak vacuum. And in addition, there might be some constant, which is uh, independent of uh, the Higgs field, so-called dark energy, and there might be additional higher order interactions. So a lot of things about the Higgs to understand. So let me say a little bit about the instability of the vacuum and the future of the universe. So the horizontal vector here represents the uh, magnitude of the Higgs field. And we know it's got a non-zero but relatively small value. When you calculate in a standard model and you go up to very large scales, we find that the potential goes down and become negative. Because in quantum mechanics, eventually you will tunnel through to the lowest energy state. So eventually, according to this picture, the future of the universe will be a big crunch where you have a very dense quagmire of Higgs. So how do you stop that? Well, you want to prevent potential from going down. And Ali will tell you what is the theory that prevents it from going down. You let it go. Ah, wrong well, answer. <laughs> Super submission. Now, now supersymmetry can do a lot of other things for you. And one of the things that it can do for you is uh, answer another puzzle in cosmology, which is the nature of dark matter. So the story of dark matter, uh, in the way that I understand it, uh, goes back 90 years. And it goes back to this guy here, Fritz Zwicky, uh, Swiss astronomer, who, uh, as you can tell, was a bit of a character. Anyway, in the 1930s, he was uh, observing the motions of galaxies in the coma cluster of galaxies. He found they were moving too fast. Uh, by rights, they should be flying apart, not bound together in, in a cluster. So the answer that she proposed was that there was some additional source of gravitational field to hold those galaxies together, something which he couldn't see, and so he called it dark matter. That was the 1930s. People didn't pay a tremendous amount of attention until the 1970s, when along came uh, Vera Rubin, who observed the motions of uh, stars uh, around galaxies. So Zwicky so was galaxies in clusters, she was stars and gas clouds in galaxies. And she found they also moved too quickly. And so she proposed the same explanation that there must be some invisible source of gravitational field, the famous dark matter. So there's, this is a, a, a picture of, of what she observed. So we know that in the solar system, uh, the further you are from the sun, the lower your velocity, just Kepler's law. But if you look at objects going around the galaxy, that's not the case. The velocities remain constant. That tells you that in addition to the mass, which is concentrated in the middle, like in the sun and the solar system, in addition to that mass, there must be a distributed halo of dark matter. And uh, what's that made of? Well, dark matter and the dark matter, according to this picture, would be uh, spread out further 
and the uh, visible stars and gas. So what is this dark matter made of? Well, maybe it's made of particles. And what better candidate to be those particles than supersymmetric particles? Like, there's a pretty smart student in the final version. <laughs> so according to supersymmetry, uh, every known type of particle has a partner as yet unseen, which has the same internal properties like electric charge, but it spins at a different rate. So the particle is a fermion, supersymmetric partner is a boson, and vice versa. And simple theories of this type, the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable, and it's neutral, and it's perfect candidate to be the dark matter. Okay, so if that's the case, how might you hope to produce it at the LHC? Well, you would produce these particles, and they, you couldn't see them directly because they have no charge, no interactions, but they carry energy and momentum. So here's a computer simulation. So here's a bunch of visible particles coming out, lots of energy, and over on the left-hand side, there's nothing, or at least nothing very much. And that's because in this simulation, uh, supersymmetric particles carried off energy and momentum. So uh, the LHC experiments have been looking for events like that. And they see them. But all the events they see are compatible with the energy carried away belonging to neutrinos, which we're not interested in. But the search continues. Search also continues directly for astrophysical dark matter. So the, the idea is that uh, there's dark matter around us all the time. And uh, so uh, roughly speaking, this glass of water uh, at any given instant contains the equivalent of a hydrogen uh, nucleus of dark matter. Now, whether that's made of particles that are the same as a hydrogen nucleus, or whether it's a much heavier particle, a much lighter particle, we don't know, but it could be a particle that if you wanted to detect, you have to go deep underground where you avoid the backgrounds coming from cosmic rays, you shield your detector so that you don't get backgrounds from major activity in the rock. And uh, you look for events where a dark matter particle comes through, it hits some nucleus, and uh, then you pick up the required energy of the nucleus. So, plenty of experiments around the world looking for that, but uh, they haven't had any luck yet either. So, how about the origin of matter? So, Trying to understand the origin of matter is motivation that we uh, particle physicists have for looking at uh, antimatter physics. So uh, we're not interested in powering up Starship Enterprise. We're not interested in playing up the Vatican. We just want to understand the fact that matter and antimatter particles seem to be almost the same and different, but not quite. There's a small breaking of the asymmetry between matter and antimatter, which we're trying to understand. So it was uh, Dirac almost 100 years ago, who when he was combining quantum mechanics with relativity, predicted the existence of antimatter particles. And the first antimatter particles were discovered a few years later in the cosmic rays. But he and everybody else thought that matter and antimatter particles would be exactly equal and opposite. So electron negative charge, positron positive charge, proton, antiproton, and so on and so forth. But it was discovered uh, almost 60 years ago now 
that in some cases, the particle and the antiparticle don't behave in quite equal and opposite ways. Shortly afterwards, the Russian physicist Sakharov came along and said, well, you know, maybe that very small difference would explain why it is that matter dominates over antimatter in the universe today. And that motivates, in particular, the LHCB experiment itself. So uh, this is a picture of uh, Sakharov visiting uh, CERN in about uh, 1990. So what he said was, look, if you've got a, a universe that's expanding, and if matter and antimatter don't behave quite equal and opposite, and if you have a uh, breakdown of thermal equilibrium, for example, during a first sort of phase transition and during the decay of a massive particle, then the small matter antimatter difference could give you a small excess of matter of antimatter. And then later on, as the universe expands, you will be left with those few extra matter particles, all the antimatter particles, which have annihilated. So it's a great idea, uh, but you know, the challenge is to uh, find a theory that you can calculate with laboratory data and compare the experiment. But with this, this, this could be the explanation for the origin of matter. So now I come to uh, Einstein's dream. So um, I was uh, asked earlier on today whether I'd given up on grad unification. I said, no, I haven't given up on grad unification. I think it's you know, one of the deepest challenges that we have as theoretical physicists to try to find a unified formulation of all the fundamental interactions. So uh, I labeled it here uh, Einstein's dream. So he spent his last years trying to construct such a theory. And uh, this doesn't work on the left side. This is his last blackboard. And uh, maybe the reason why, as a kid, he looked a bit young, uh, when he was young, he looked a bit sad in this picture here because he had maybe a premonition that he wasn't going to succeed, but at least he tried. So one of the suggestions that he tried was that there might be additional dimensions of space. And uh, this is a very fashionable idea still today. Um, string theorists uh, regularly postulate the addition of the uh, existence of extra dimensions of space. So in some theories with uh, extra dimensions, gravity would become strong at the uh, C energy scale. And in some such theories, it would suggest that the LHC might produce black holes. And then some people got very nervous that maybe those black holes would eat up the entire Earth, uh, which of course would not be the case, much too small. Uh, they would just vanish very quickly before they had the chance to eat anything. And if you don't believe that argument, remember those cosmic rays hitting the Earth for billions of years, we're still here. So uh, don't think you have to worry about uh, microscopic black holes being produced by the LHC. On the other hand, it would be great if the LHC did produce black holes, because then we would have a laboratory to study quantum gravity. But anyway. So, so that brings me to the uh, end of what I was planning to uh, talk about. So I hope I've convinced you that the uh, LHC is uh, not only the world's most powerful microscope, but is also in some sense a telescope, uh, which is addressing Gauguin's questions by making little bangs that reproduce the Big Bang. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So we have uh, time for questions. Thank you for questions. Yeah. So, in your opinion, you believe that dark matter is made of supersymmetric particles, and one day you will find the vectors in a, the HC. So it's a possibility. It's not the only possibility. And uh, I have to confess that I'm uh, hedging my bets. So uh, my uh, next paper to appear on the archive will be about supersymmetric dark matter. But my previous paper on the archive was uh, talking about uh, ultralight personic fields such as may come from uh, string theory. And maybe they might be in the dark matter. And so it's a different type of experiment which you would do which look for them. So uh, I, I'm not really a, a betting man. Uh, uh, I think the best way of trying to figure out what odds I would give for which theory is how many papers have I written about one theory as opposed to another one? And so far, I've written a lot more papers about supersymmetry than. Ultralight bosons, but you know, that might change with time. I don't think that that applies to Ali. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, mean, I think yeah, you've also got a, <clears throat> a stakeholder interest in, in like uh, bosonic particles, don't you? Right. Uh, <clears throat> yes, is Chris. Uh, so, maybe I have one. Perhaps my question is about what is the nature of matter? And from a philosopher's standpoint, the nature of matter is that well, it's extended or it has impenetrability. Well, uh, I'm not sure that I like the phrase nature of matter. Uh, so, so what, I would try to answer the question what is matter made of? That's right. most fundamental. Yeah, so, uh, you know, what are the fundamental constituents of matter? And uh, there I think we've got a bunch of answers. And uh, those answers tell you that uh, you know, it's extended. And in the case of an atom, it's extended something like 100,000 times more than a nucleus. The nucleus is also extended. Um, so I think I would prefer to give a very concrete answer to that question rather than just saying, oh, well, it's something which has extent. So you answer to the of Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't have anything against philosophers, uh, uh, but I, I really believe in an empir empirical, pragmatic approach, uh, which theory is related to expand, right? uh, which I think is itself a form of philosophy. So if pressed, I will say, yes, I'm a philosopher. Uh, I'm what used to be called a natural philosopher. Okay. Um, but the sort of philosophical question that you are asking uh, is not up my street. Just, uh, I just, um, uh, think that it for some general feature of something, it wouldn't say, well, there are, there are various articles. What is it that characterizes the particles themselves in a, you know, a common and general way? And then that's why I would say things like, well, it's uh, extension or yeah, well, impenetrability with consistency being penetrated. Mm, well, so, so then I would start to disagree with your philosophy because. Um, 
particle to a plus, uh, but it seems to be infinitesimally small. Right? Maybe it's actually at some very, very small scale made out of strings, but at the moment that's speculation. But an electron, for example, doesn't have any extent that we can that we can detect. Uh, it should have some quantity of space. Well, it, it, it's influence extends over some region of space because it uh, is a source in case of an electron of an electromagnetic field. We can measure over some extent. But, but the electron itself, according to our theory, looks just like a point, a Euclidean point. Sorry. <laughs> I think there was, a, there was a question at the front. So we have not seen any evidence for any interaction apart from gravity. So how does it uh, collapse with certain parts of the brain? Now, not with muscle, but with Right. So actually, uh, presumably, the dark matter does not collapse to form singularities. I mean, it, it does. Uh, so so the, the density of dark matter varies, and then places where it is more dense become more dense, right? But, but you're absolutely right that there is uh, no process of uh, dissipation unless the dark matter has some sort of interaction with itself or with something else. So my usual theorem is not into it. This would have that act of gravitation anyway. It's not just the fact that you can gravitation. Right, but that's, that's very, very weak. Yeah. Well, but yeah, it comes, but uh, um, black holes that we see around us, I think they're not made up out of dark matter, they're made out of regular matter, which uh, has dissipative interactions, which enables it to, to lose energy, collapse to a uh, singularity. Can we? Well, um, I'm just saying that dark matter So, so it, it has to be able to dissipate well, if it has any sorts of interactions, it can dissipate. We don't know that it has any interactions. It might just be purely gravitational interactions. Yes? Oh, we, have, we have somebody in the back just for a second. I mean, that's what I'm not going to explain the science of the class. Um, I'll talk about the slide where it says the and how uh, the laser mass is the weight, and then I'm fine with the laser mass the energy. We can also ask if you want to update that now. Can you see that mass is a measurement for a complication of the interaction between particles and the ice field? And another question that we may have answered do we know the difference of what made some particles massive and others massive? Okay. So, so, so yes. Uh, basically, we would say that uh, mass is a property of a light like particle, which uh, originates from its interaction with uh, this universal Higgs field. Uh, and we don't have a theory for why some particles have big masses, some particles have small masses. But in answer to your second question, uh, there are certain uh, symmetries, properties of particles that tell us uh, that they have to have zero mass. And the photon is a good example of that. Uh, so there is a, uh, a symmetry, I'm not going to name it, but there is a symmetry which guarantees that it remains massless. But, uh, and you on, uh, likewise. Uh, first, uh, I really uh, envy you and all that you did this research working at that kind of scale and still keep safe. <laughs> um, you indicated that there are a number of things we don't know about. We don't have answers. 
And I don't expect that my question has an answer. Any parts of this would be greatly appreciated. Malta was created uh, during the Big Bang uh, event about 13.7 million years ago. I think that's the number that is going now. Yeah. And before that, there was no matter, no vacuum. And uh, obviously, my question is how do you go from vacuum to just one hydrogen, one protein? So I, I would actually say that we uh, have no idea uh, what there was before the Big Bang. Uh, in fact, I'd even go so far as to say we don't even know there was a before the Big Bang. So our laws of physics enable us to uh, calculate, extrapolate, estimate what happened back to some fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. Uh, and then the equations break down. So uh, it, it could be that there was no t equal to zero. It could be there were only positive t's, t for time. And it could be there was no negative t. Well, that's possible, but you know, that's speculation. Right? And uh, I think uh, one of the ways that I keep saying is by trying not to speculate too wildly. Is it possible that? The universe going to collapse as you know, predicted. It. It's also that the unification of matter and the matter, dark energy versus visible energy, will give us back to the original world and back to the heavy world. Okay, so I, I think if there was something at t equal to zero, if somehow either you could avoid what seemed to be a singularity in our equations, it had to be something with a tremendous energy density, tremendous positive energy density. And uh, the fate of the universe that we're headed towards looked like it's a completely different sort of universe, um, so called anti Decitic universe. Um, so it, 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 it looks like it's not a cyclical universe unless we can invent some new physics. Yeah. Yeah, so So when I talk about the universe collapsing, I'm talking about going down to here. There's a very dense, uh, this condition with a very dense Higgs field, which would have less energy in it than the state where we are now, and hence energetically being preferred, we would eventually tunnel into it. Now, um, supersymmetry avoids that by uh, making a theory where energy is guaranteed to be positive. And that's illustrated in my picture here by the straight line that goes up to infinity. According to supersymmetry, if you go up to large values of the Higgs field, uh, the energy just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the state of uh, the universe, the quantum state of the universe, can stay where it is now. Okay, and uh, in that case, you uh, would indeed have a, a, an exponentially expanding state of the universe, which is what I uh, illustrated here. So, uh, you know, some people have argued that that would be infinitely depressing because as the universe expands, uh, everything loses uh, energy, light loses energy. And uh, people would say, well, no, life would become impossible because uh, life is just it's a so called heat death. But uh, AI gives us hope right? because uh, 
AI says that you can make something that uh, simulates intelligence, maybe actually eventually it will become intelligent, I don't think it is yet, at least it simulates intelligence without being alive in normal biological sense. So I think an interesting question is whether uh, AI systems could survive into the infinite future. So maybe we can't, but maybe they can. I, I hope that's encouraging. So question at the back. You should be looking into the things that you find interesting. You should be looking into the things that you find interesting because if you're not passionate about what you're doing, you're not going to get very far. And uh, the other thing which I would say uh, is to uh, you know, read around. Don't just go sort of stuck in uh, your particular research problem or research field, but uh, read more generally what's going on in uh, the world of sciences related maybe in some way to yours. And then uh, at some point, you know, some idea might, uh, might come up and uh, that will give you a, a new research direction to follow. Okay, maybe we'll give a, an opportunity for some online participants to ask a question. Any questions from the online uh, participants? You can uh, unmute you and ask. Yes, Garo? Uh, first of all, thank you, Professor, for your talk. I wanted to ask whether any hypotheses have been suggested other than dark matter that can reasonably account for why galaxies are moving too quickly. Okay, so there have been uh, various ideas that have been uh, postulated uh, for uh, modifying gravity. And one of the uh, uh, criminals responsible for that is sitting in the front row. <laughs> uh, so, so most such theories of modified gravity, to my mind, are, are very ugly. And it, it's not clear to me they really do all the job that uh, dark matter does. So I didn't have time to discuss it. But you have to explain also what happens when you collide clusters of galaxies, so-called bullet cluster being the prime example. Uh, you have to explain uh, the... Uh, atom of fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation, which just using conventional uh, plasma physics enables you to estimate the density of ordinary matter and also of dark matter. So uh, you have to come up with a modified theory of gravity, which um, does all those things. And uh, every once in a while, somebody claims to have such a theory, but I'm not convinced. Okay, please join right. me in thanking uh, uh, Mr. Ellis again. Uh, we're serving tea and cookies, and there will be plenty of time for further questions informally with our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.